Well, my life as a publisher and, uh, if I may say so, although a small one, a force in publishing began with my marriage to Shoshana, who's sitting here. We've really been partners in most of the things I've done in my life. And uh, we put out quite a few innovative periodicals, as you enumerated. Uh, and um, I started actually with just, uh, it was $400. I started huh. Eros. Uh, back then, this was in 1961 or two. Okay, you could sell a publication before its first issue appeared. You can't do that today because consumer protection laws, so-called, uh, prohibit that. You can't sell something that doesn't already exist. Oh, really? You can, right. That's why there are so many announcements for new magazines that say, "Send no money. We'll bill you later." Huh? Because if you ask for money in advance, you get into trouble today. However. The tradition of having prospective subscribers to a periodical underwrite it before it even commences publication goes back to the days of Benjamin Franklin. Yes. It was a time-honored tradition that people who had a particular turn of mind, who shared a particular attitude and wished to launch a periodical in that field could subscribe. Subscribe comes from the Latin. It means underwrite. Those potential subscribers underwrote the periodical even before it appeared. And I got in at the very end of that, <laughs> when it was still permissible, and that's how I launched my first periodical. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was, it, 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 it obviously filled the void because the money came rolling in. Uh -huh. The $400 was for postage to send out an announcement, 10,000 direct mail pieces, and the money just kept rolling in, and we kept piling and piling it. Till eventually we had, you know, a, a serious sum of money. Huh. The first issue was published, and the rest is history. And let me just throw in that because it wasn't subsidized by advertisers, um, we didn't have to worry about censorship or putting something in we didn't believe because the advertiser thought it was important. Mm -hmm. Right. Our publications did not carry advertising until the very end. Right? Now, what was in the first issue? What were some of the things in the first issue? The first issue, gee, well, we had 11 the Bible, where we had uh, some brilliant artists <laughs> illustrate some of the more salacious passages. David of the and Bible. Bathsheba. Huh. Right. And uh, we, all we did was take the actual biblical language and artwork that was hanging in the leading museums of the world. Huh. And were there, were there nude photos in that magazine? Well, there were photos. There were engravings. There were and paintings by Rembrandt. Uh -huh. You know and. <laughs> So, so it's a long and short. What, what got the authorities so upset about this? Well, I'll tell you. I wish I could give you an exact answer. I can get. It may sound that as though I'm being evasive, but I'm not. Yeah, I, I mean this right. from, right. with all right. my heart. Right. You know, at the time of sexual revolution, Hugh Hefner became almost overnight one of the richest publishers in America. Larry Flint was cleaning up. Right. Bob Guccione with his penthouse and several other publishers. They yes. were all making millions of dollars. And the uptightness of this country, the equivalent of today's... Well, let me just interrupt. Some of those people came after you. They came after... Who came, you, they, like Guccione and Flint, didn't they? No, they were my time. contemporaries. Oh, they really? Yeah, really. Huh. In fact, yeah, ha, right. They, but they weren't aiming for the no, same... Flint came afterwards. Well, Flint, right. I mean, Flint came after you. Right, but uh, Hefner had just about been around, right. so had Guccione. In fact, it was after I had published an issue of Two of Eros that both of them independently invited me to accept major jobs with their corporations. Huh. I wasn't interested, of course, by then. I was glad to be my own independent and publisher. And they weren't mm. showing sex as classy. That's they right. weren't mm. saying that everyone, all, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Terrific in Top Hat and Tails can have sex, too. <laughs> you know, it's not so much classy as it was the level of psychological maturity that was reflected that in our publications. Absolutely. That's what was different. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the girly books like Playboy and Penthouse, uh, they're, they're rather juvenile. They're rather adolescent fantasies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're rather adolescent. They, um, they reflect the attitudes of an individual who's not quite fully mature, in yes. my belief. Yes, yes, yes. Well, our magazine wasn't that way. And uh, uh, Flint's magazines, I mean, they were positively psychopathic. I mean, I don't <laughs> like to really be right. uh, associated with them because right. they're demented. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I mean, uh, yeah. but so our magazines were quite... But 
to answer your question, this is really a roundabout way to the public generally, the uptightness in our society, like the Christian coalition equivalents of back then, right, right. who were anti-sexual, were very upset about the sexual re revolution. Here, the flower power children were really having a good time with sex, as they were never able to have in their time. Right, right. And they prompted uh, the, the uh, Justice Department mm -hmm. to go after me. Also, I was a much easier target because my publications were not on the newsstand. They were sold exclusively by subscription okay. through the mail. Okay. And okay. the, the anti-obscenity statutes of the post office were a very convenient device with which the government could nab me. I see. All they had to do was go to a court and persuade a judge or jury huh. that my publications were obscene. Huh. What is obscene? You tell me. Right, it's right. just a bag of smoke. The concept right. is as indefinable right. as the de as witchery is. Well, well, just like the Supreme Court <laughs> Justice once said that uh, pornography, I know it when I see it. That's right. That was Justice Stewart. Stewart. People Stewart, who yeah. had never seen it were writing into the Justice Department. Right, complaining about Nuns, it. Groups of nuns who had right. never nuns. seen never the seen publication. It. <laughs> there was an organized... Uh, movement against to get me apparently and it worked i'll tell you exactly what happened by the way i was i was brought i was uh, a grand jury commenced an um an investigation for a possible indictment here in new york city okay and i asked to be heard by that grand jury and i was it's by right you know a person's right has a right to appear before a grand jury okay if they know a grand jury is considering it okay. and i got before him and i told him what i was about with the magazine i showed it to them and we discussed it and guess what they handed up no bill. In other words, they refused huh. to indict me. Huh. So Bobby Kennedy, who was then the Attorney General, yes. took the case to Newark, and he did the same thing there, and the same thing happened. Huh. The, the grand jury refused to indict me in Newark. So he went further down the line to Philadelphia, which was a very uptight community yeah, then, yeah. and yes, yeah, sure enough, they did indict me, and they got me before a huh. hand-picked judge who was an anti-Semite, I might add, huh. and was eventually kicked off the case huh. because he revealed his anti-Semitism. He, he also seemed to be a racist. Huh. He did. Because he, he said did. that, he in that remember, in the black and white That's and right. his opinion, feature. His opinion in my case singled out as obscene a very beautiful set of photographs of a black man and a white woman who were dancers nude from the waist up. Huh. And he singled that out as pornographic. The guy was really demented. And these yeah. were art photographs, you know, where they the were very thing of his black hand yeah, against right. her white skin. Or there right. was the thing about where they, the line of their bodies were like two, right. two uh, mountainscapes. No, they were done it, by... They were artful. Yeah. This was not yeah. garbage. This was by a major artist, art photographer named Ralph Hattersley, yeah, who yeah. was also a professor at the New School here in New York. The, uh, anyway, it was just irony after irony after irony. This, I always want to say this is also around the time that they were running after Lenny Bruce. Uh, as exactly. Well, as yeah. well. right. uh, Lenny was an acquaintance of mine. He came uh, over yeah. to dinner. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. But anyway, I, I know that there's going to be an HBO special on him, I think, this weekend. No I, kidding. I, I believe so. Well, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. uh, or, or soon. I, I have think. stuff I could tell about Lenny. But unlike Lenny, we didn't use uh, four-letter words in our publications very often. Not no. that we were censoring them out deliberately. And not but that you're putting down Lenny either. Not at all. No. But right. it was not, you know, our publications were, were not foul mouth for the most part. So, yeah. so th your your issue um, after four issues was, was the publication was halted, and what right. what happened? I mean, you, well, I was indicted. I was suddenly confronted by defending myself in a criminal action that could send me. The actual indictment, believe it or not, carried a potential maximum imprisonment of something like 125 years. And it was pure <laughs> lunacy. <laughs> it was so. Oh well, right, right. well, I found I was indicted. Unbelievable. I had known Bobby Kennedy personally. Okay through some of my prior magazine work. I had worked for many major American magazines before I started out. Yes, you worked, for, uh, you worked for Look and, and Reader's Digest. Look and Reader's Digest, exactly. And, 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 and Esquire. And right, and it was th through my work at Look that I met Bobby Kennedy, and I knew him. I didn't know him well, by the way, but I had dealings with him. Yes. Personal dealings with him. Okay. And, um, and with his family, by the way, including the president, who, of course, he wasn't the president then, and his father, Joe Kennedy. Yeah, okay. okay. Now, um... So I found out that Bobby was uh, giving uh, a talk here at the, oh, if I can remember that organization, Freedom, not Freedom Forum, Freedom Foundation? Freedom no, House? No, it wasn't, no, it was, I'm sorry, it, maybe it'll come to me. It was a major force in America at that time. It was run by Robert Hutchins, who was, had formerly been the, pr the 
president or chancellor or whatever, the top guy at the University of Chicago. Okay. <clears throat> and I, I went over to him before and started to say, hey, Bobby, what the hell's going on here? I said, your department just indicted me. Surely you know about this. What's going on here? Yeah. What, are you out of your mind? He said, Ralph, I'm sorry. It's in court, and I can't talk to you about it. Hmm. That was the end of it. Hmm. We, we tried to approach him at that thing on the post office steps. Yeah, and, right. Uh, they, the, the Secret Service, we, we sat through this boring ceremony, and then afterwards we were going to go up and try to speak to him because we hadn't been able to get through. Hmm. And the Secret Service was hmm. there dressed in the so-called plain clothes, which are, you know, the Blues Brothers. They were very <laughs> obvious. <laughs> and they, they closed in and muscled us off. There was no way to approach, even though, wow. you know, they just pretended to be shoving us because they were part of the crowd. But the right, truth is right. they knew perfectly well who we were and where we were going. Yes. And they they shunted us aside physically like a tide of human beings. Unbelievable. So this, ca this case dragged on for 10 years. It did, because what happened is the Supreme Court, on the first day of spring in 1966, it was March 21st, I just happened to have looked it up last night because an acquaintance of mine is writing a book and he's making a reference to it, <clears throat> uh, convicted me. Hmm. And uh, then started a bunch of appeals. And the, the, oh, but it was an incredible boomerang among the American legal community because in order to convict me, the Supreme Court enunciated a new doctrine under law. It was called pandering. It never existed before. <laughs> it was a whole new subsection of the this law of obscene literature. Never been applied to anybody, never appeared in any written Right, document. he didn't do anything wrong. Let's make up yeah. a law. Yeah. Right, that's exactly right. I, was so, I haven't even tried on it. I never had a chance to defend myself I'm under really. it. But, uh, so there was a tremendous outcry by the legal profession. It was so loud and uh, impassioned that the government cooled it. And for 10 years, it took them 10 years between the time I was indicted and the time they finally decided to imprison me. Wow. And the whole time, this Damocles sword was hanging over my head. Sure, 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 sure. And during, but during that time, you were, had pub, you were publishing other publications. Other publications, including many that were uh, uh, seminal in, in the fight against the Vietnam War. Yeah. Which, and by the way, largely inspired by the efforts of the geniuses on this particular station, WBAI. Huh. They included Larry Josephson, okay. Bob Fass, okay. Steve Post was, I think, his name, yes. and there were many others. Yes. And of course, uh, Bob Fass Jerry is still Rubin. here at, at BAI. Is he? Okay. Yes, he is. Uh, Jerry yeah, Rubin I, used to be a, a vital part of the station, yes. and Abby Hoffman. Yes. So, yes. you know, we go back to those days. Wow. And my year was always on WBAI, and in fact, huh. in, the, in what was my favorite magazine of the magazines we created, and it was titled by Shoshana, Avant Garde, we did a major piece on WBAI. Huh. I'm sorry, I didn't bring the issue with me. I would have loved to open it and talk to you about it. Yeah. I thought you were going to say that some of our other things were also seminal in the kind of investigative journalism that's being done in regularly that's in true. every day's newspaper example, today. Because in those days, it was a nation of somnambulists, and nobody was talking about <laughs> very urgent issues. They were all, you know, it was uh, not permitted to speak about religion, politics, or right. sex. So those were our main topics. Right, and exactly. Fact Magazine came out with the fact that American cars were death traps and not crash worthy, and we mm. gave Ralph Nader the piece. We right. gave him the start. Huh. Go ahead. You, yes, Go ahead. absolutely. Wow, wow. Yeah, we decided we were going to do a piece on the uncrash worthiness of American cars. Uh -huh. I had read a scholarly article by an engineer, his name was Henry Wakesland, on this subject. Obviously, I'm not an engineer, and I didn't know anything about it, mm -hmm. but I thought it was an incredible eye-opener. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I started to research it, and I asked Wakeland if he knew anyone who would care to write about it. He couldn't write about it for some reason or other. So he said, no, but there's this kid at Harvard, Rafi Nader, who has an interest in the subject. Maybe he'll write it for you. So I contacted Nader, and I had him write the article, and it, he brought it in right on deadline, and I'll tell you something. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? It was absolutely unpublishable. <laughs> so I, I told him so, and I paid him in full, and in fact, I kept his endorsed, clear check because of what he, <laughs> what he later became. <laughs> but I had to do the piece over myself, so it ran under my own my name. Oh, wow. And uh, but may, the, the article was so hugely impactful that Nader saw that, and he went on a couple of years later to write his book called Unsafe at Any Speed. Yes, yes. Now, that book went nowhere until 
the morons at the top of General Motors decide that in order to counteract whatever message he may have had in his book, they're going to try and drudge up some personal mark about Rafi Nader, and they put private detectives on his tail. Right. Boy, did they right. pick the wrong guy. Right. If there <laughs> ever was a Mr. Ultra America straight, yeah, that's right. it's Ralph Nader. Most boring he, is so, he really is. He's boring. boring, clean, that's straight. Right. That's, that's right. Ralph Nader. <laughs> that's and right. he was smart enough to know to make the most of it. And he made a gigantic stink about it. And GM had a fess up. And that, he overnight became Mr. Rectitude yes. of America in any <laughs> issue. The environment, you know, Car safety, cigarettes, you name it. Yes. And that, that he was roughing that. Right. We were the first ones to come out that cigarettes cause cancer. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, that too. Let, let me also say, by the way, we're on WBAI in 1999. This is uh, August 5th, 1999. Shelton Walden here on Walden's Pond. This is the program. This is the program. And this afternoon, we have a privilege of talking with Ralph and Shoshana Ginsburg. Ralph uh, Ginsburg is the author of a brand new book, which we haven't even talked about yet, <laughs> called, <laughs> called I Shot New York, a news photographer's chronicle of 365 days in the world's most photogenic metropolis. His wife, Shoshana Ginsburg, is here, and she, is, she did the captions for the book. And the foreword is by George Plimpton, the, uh, the uh, of course, the noted author and the editor of the Parish Review. And um, I, I actually, before we go, uh, and I want to uh, talk about, um, there's so much to talk about. Actually, I want to talk about George Plimpton for just for a second. There's a picture I saw many years ago of him. Uh, he was at the Robert Kennedy assassination. And mm-hmm. there's a picture of him. I, I, it's, it's really, I think it's, I think it's one of the great photographs which is really seen. He's in the pantry after Robert Kennedy is shot. And he's trying to grab on to Sirhan Sirhan. And he's straining their 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 his face is contorted, and it's a picture of him, uh, and Rosie Greer, the football player, and someone else who I can't quite name, and they're grabbing onto Sir Hanson right after the shot. I think it's an incredible photograph. Wow. I never even heard of it. That's yeah, amazing. No, it's in uh, I believe it's in Time Magazine. Uh, I think it was a week after the assassination. Uh, or the issue of the assassination, and they're grabbing on to Sirhan Sirhan, and he, and, and he was happened to be, I guess, a couple of feet away from it from when it happened. I don't know if he's ever talked about that. I guess he has. No. He has. To, I have seen him talk wow. about the assassination. I've never, he never mentioned but, it to me. But he, but he's grabbing on to Sirhan. He's and and Rosie Greer, the football player, is there. He's grabbing. Everybody's, you know, just, you know. Well, it's in and, a situation yeah, like that yeah. that you find out what a guy is made of. That's right. Absolutely. Now. Oh, also, your, the magazine Eros, uh, which I, uh, which had four issues, y- the the aut- the autumn 1962 issue of Eros magazine, which you pu- which you published, had the last fo- uh, portraits of Marilyn Monroe. Right. That's uh, that's uh, that's pretty. And it just shows you how sick uh, the times were. Two months before she uh, died. Right. They were shot by a really great photographer who's still a very much an active photographer. His name is Bert Stern, hmm. and. Uh, it was very peculiar that we, this small, relatively small magazine, should have been first to publish those. But a couple of the pictures show her, if you're really strained, you can see her nipples under a gauze, huh. uh, huh. whatever it is she was wearing. Huh. And that was considered too hotsy totsy huh. for America's leading magazines huh. at the time. Huh. So Stern gave them to us, helping that or facilitating his bringing us the picture with the fact that our art director was the finest in America. It was the late, great Herb Lou Ballon, hmm. who was, uh, I think he's generally acknowledged to be the greatest graphic designer hmm. of the 20th century. Hmm. And so, uh, altogether, Herb laid it out beautifully, certainly to uh, Stern's complete satisfaction. In fact, uh, we later republished him in a totally different version in another of our publications, the one called Avant Garde. I think I started to mention earlier that of all the periodicals we produced, my favorite was it not Eros, it was Avant Garde. Because it had more latitude. Right, it wasn't just sex. You didn't have to stick to love and sex, although everything is related to love and sex. (laughs) It still gave you more options. Right, it had more political orientation and art. So you... you, um, you spent you spent eight months uh, in in federal uh, prison because of the the, the government's um, relentless perse- uh, persecution, I would say, of, of your magazine and quote unquote obscenity laws. But um, the uh, actually this is interesting. The you, uh, you say here that the United States Supreme Court were were um, Justice William Brennan, this right. liberal, he, uh. he he wrote the majority opinion 
in a 5-4 decision against you. That's correct. And then he was subsequently lionized as this champion of freedom of expression. <laughs> I mean, the whole case was such a non-stop irony after irony. Mm. Right. Now, what happened was in prison, of course, because of the backlash, which I spoke of earlier, within the legal community, the public reaction wouldn't mean very much to him. Mm. Or at least it wouldn't mean as much to him as the backlash within the community, within the legal community. He was so mocked up by eloquent lawyers over what he did in my case that he actually changed his mind on the subject of obscenity. Huh. He has said so. Hmm. His clerks have written so. Hmm. And uh, he, he, from then on, he took the opposite position on, for, on, on sexual matters, mm -hmm. expression of sex in print. That mm -hmm. is to say that they merited First Amendment protection. Yes. Hey, listen, let me tell you about another irony. The New York Times editorialized on the day after my, the Supreme Court affirmation of my conviction yeah. that I deserved what I got. Really? Ah, yes. Now, again, there was a backlash over that, and I must say <laughs> that when, at one stage or other over the next few years, before I was in prison, because the thing just bounced around from court to court, wow. the Times changed its tune somewhat huh. and said, well, maybe I shouldn't be in prison for five years. Maybe a lesser sentence is in order. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Uh, but this people are very sweet. upset about sex, and it comes from, you know, teachings when they're very young. And so I mean, people they are still think upset that about it's right. Absolutely, they can lose their minds. Freedom of right. speech on every subject, First Amendment, except sex. Right. And and uh, it's just like in animal form, when, you know, all animals are equal, but pigs are more equal than other animals. And meanwhile, That's great. Meanwhile, the, the, the <laughs> <laughs> especially when it comes to sex. Right. <laughs> That's right. But well, what about rabbits? Right. The, but meanwhile, the culture is is it's just saturated with sex. Uh, we're saturated with images of sex. Yeah, or, but or, you know, it is everywhere. Don't imagine yeah. it's just our culture. We actually is because we are somewhat f more free and easy about yeah, sex. Yeah are able to, we see it exhibited more in the, sec, yeah. in the, in the mass media. Yes. Let's talk, do you want, I mean, we're off on such a tangent. Yeah, I we're going to get really. to the book. book, I know. But, uh, we're, we're on WBA, which is why I want to uh, move from, from that after, after, your, uh, after that, uh, that, that prison sentence and uh, you left there. Uh, in um, 1985, you changed your call into a photographer. And then um, you became a, a um, you went to, 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 to the I photography began, business, yes. Right, well, became a news photographer. News photographer. Right. Well, I started out, well, what happened was around that time, this is about 15 years ago, mm -hmm. the, the great, great Lou Barron, whom I named earlier, had resigned, and a couple of my chief lieutenants, uh, rather, Lou Barron died, and uh, my, some of my lieutenants uh, resigned. They went on to much bigger jobs. They're still very big in, in the media industry. Mm -hmm. um, I decided I'd sort of had it. The publication, the, the company, by the way, had suddenly become very profitable. Mm -hmm. Money's worth had 2.4 million circulation. Wow. I mean, wow. to put that into perspective, uh, that's about... That's a lot of people. That's as much as the Daily News and the New York Times put together. Wow. wow. Okay? Wow. Um, but... But what? But but it wasn't fun. It was fun. pushing you into being more of a businessman. Yeah, less right. Of a creative of a individual creative guy. you so really I, are. Right. I gave uh, all my staffers two years' notice, and I said, hey, gang, we're yeah. going to show I'm not going to bankruptcy, paid all the creditors, paid everybody every cent, and uh, liquidated the company. Okay. And uh, I warned everybody, I told them, if you get another job off and take it, if not, you're mm. going to get a bonus if you hang around. And I became a news photographer. I started out just as a, a freelancer for the Associated Press and then United Press International and then the News, the Post, mm -hmm. the Times, Newsday. Uh -huh. and, uh, and now I shot New York. Now you, spent, right. you spent a whole year in 1995 uh, for, photographing every, every part of New York. Wonderful photographs in here. Um, to tell us, I mean, how did you do this? How, first of all, how did you prepare for something like this? Because you, you took a photograph every single day. That means you were working every single day. Right. Well, it wasn't just one photograph either. The, it took an, uh, quite a bit of preparation. For one thing, I set up a dark room in the spare toilet of my midtown apartment here. Mm. And uh, I got a, a police scanner, which enables news photographers to jump on emergency news okay. when it's reported to uh, the police and fire department, for example. Mm. And most important of all, I, I arranged for access to what is called a day book. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. A day book, which I'm sure you get at the station. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes. Right. 
A day book is uh, a listing of scheduled news events yes. of the day. And... Um, prepared by the AP, yes. Yeah, it's, it's prepared by AP, and there are others. Yeah. This enables news photographers, for example, to be at a press conference at City Hall when the mayor is going to give David Cohn the key to the city. Because right, he, right. He, you see, the, otherwise, how do people know about all these exactly, things? Exactly, exactly. So, okay, so I had to get access to that, which I, I managed. And then I would shoot a minimum of three subjects a day that I thought would yield satisfactory news photographs. Mm -hmm. I had to shoot three a day because very often these things don't pan off or they're canceled. Right. And I had to be sure. I, since this is a chronicle of every year in the day 1995. Every, every day, day I, in the year. Every day in every the day year. In yeah. The year of the year. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I could not afford to be without a publishable picture on any one day of that year. So to cover myself, I would shoot three events per I day. I see, I see. Wow. And so, and of course... Uh, and you had, a you had a lot of equipment. You had a, you had a lot well, of... Well, there's a standard bag that a news photographer carries. There are occasions that call for special equipment, which I'll get into in a moment. Mm -mm. But for those of your listeners who are interested in photography... A news photographer normally carries two bodies, about 10 to 12 rolls of film, usually high speed, ISO 400 or 800, mm -hmm. sometimes 1600, mm -hmm. and uh, an assortment of lenses ranging from a super wide angle, I carry a 15 to 35, then a medium range lens, mine is a 35, 135, and then a long range, mine is 100 to 300, plus a flash. Okay. And then there's a lot of sort of little small garbage, okay. a flash uh, battery pack, which is very heavy, mm -hmm. and I carry uh, earplugs in case I find myself in front of the microphone, the loudspeakers right. at uh, an event, a rock concert or something like that. Right. And uh, so there's a and band you aid. carry a rig yourself, right? The way you cover it over your flash with special. Yeah, stuff. right. Anyway, the, that that those are normal. Now, if you're going now, for example, there are pictures in the book of President Ford picking his nose, picking his nose. Um. Uh, well, uh, actually, actually he's blowing his, his nose. He's, he's blowing, blowing his, his nose, nose pick, and he's pick, picking his teeth. Picking his teeth with his finger right. when he's being honored at a <laughs> banquet by the Korea <laughs> Society at the, <laughs> the major, I think it was the New York Hilton. Right. And uh, he's looking doing, to see who he made the plates right. that they He were turns doing. over the butter plate yeah. yes. to see who made it. <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and the square of butter is still on the plate. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, uh, the point I bring this up is not to mortify no, they have some, they have some okay. fun. I already deserves yeah, it. He made a speech against me. He falls down all the time. Yeah, yeah. No, but more than that, he made a speech <laughs> against me. I have to represent him. He made a speech against yeah, me. the bastard really <laughs> did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, he, when, he, when he was in, in, in the, the House of Representatives, he wasn't president yet. He wasn't <laughs> vice president yet. He made, goes around, comes around. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so this was, uh, this was payback time. <laughs> that, that's great. That's great. Anyway, to get that shot, I had to use 600 millimeters. Now, if you're into photography, that's a real blunderbuss. It's oh, a yeah. three-foot-long lens. It weighs yeah. a ton. Yeah, you have a picture here, I think, of the camera. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, There's yeah, a yeah, picture yeah, of me holding yeah, that. Yeah, Wait, okay. Just inside the back cup. Yeah, it looks like a telescope. Exactly. It's enormous. It weighs 13 uh, pounds. Look, 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 Ralph set up that picture, and I popped the shutter. Shana took that picture. <laughs> okay. no, he, set it up. Credit. he set it up, and I pushed the button when he was ready. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. 99.5 FM. The Bee Gees. By the way, 20 years ago, they had a concert here in New York. Actually, had a big concert here in New York, and uh, I went to that, and I, I must admit, I was a big Bee Gees fan. Yes, um, you can shoot me, but I was a big Bee Gees fan. At <laughs> any rate, we're on WBAI, Walden's Pond here, and we're talking with Ralph and Shoshana Ginsburg. They're the authors of I Shot New York, looking at 365 days of life here in New York. And uh, before we go to the calls, uh, one thing I noticed about the book, and you have um, photographs of the of politicians, of course, uh, uh, of uh, the mayor here, Giuliani, of um, um, the, and president. the president. Right. But, but, but also I noticed that, uh, sadly, yeah, no, of course, that there are pictures of people who have uh, passed away well before their time in this book, uh, including Princess Diana and uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. most recently. Um, Bill Kunstler. Bill Kunstler, Alan, Alan Ginsberg. Right. Um, it's just kind of poignant about that, too. It just, um, how, how, it's a measure of how time moves on. Uh, the late uh, King Hussein of Jordan. Uh, oh, yeah, right. 
And um, there were some pictures here mm. of, of you caught people in moments of um, uh, of, of a death. Uh, one man had jumped off an uh, apartment building uh, at, at marriage, at times of marriage. It's a very interesting uh, slice of life here about New York City. Thank you. Say. Yeah. And anything that was st stood out about, uh, what was the most uh, difficult shot to get? Oh, the most difficult shot by far was a picture of a plane taking off from runway 13 on Friday the 13th. Huh. It was po that was the picture of the day on Friday the 13th. I mm -hmm. think it was March, but I'm not sure of that. And uh, I just had to arrange everything perfectly. I had to get up in a chopper and get, obviously, the chopper pilot had to get permission to get over this plane it, at a busy hour. It was mid-morning, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And the plane was just swinging into, I don't know what you call that, the end, the tarmac, do you the call that? Uh, I guess. It was Is that the end of the runway? Yeah, they had to get ready to take off. To get ready to take, to off. Get take yeah. off. it. It has a gigantic 13 on it. That was the runway number. Yes. So uh, that was actually the hardest picture to take. Huh. The easiest picture to take was uh, it showed a crescent moon and Jupiter, I believe it was, and or was it Venus? One of those planets uh -huh, uh -huh. in very close proximity. I just got out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I went out, and I said, hey, that looks very weird to have the planet that close wow. to the moon. Wow. So I set up this big blunderbuss lens we were talking about that looks like a telescope. And I shot the picture. And, did uh, you really get? Did you get worn out after a certain period of time? I did. It was around August of that year when I was uh, had been doing it for eight months, yeah. and I said, "Gee, I hope I can finish this. I'm <laughs> really getting burned out. Yeah. I mean, I had no time to brush my teeth. My teeth were rotting. I had huge <laughs> dental bills after that year. If you look at this finger, uh -huh. it's crooked uh -huh. because I smashed it when I was taking a picture of, from a Coast Guard boat. Uh -huh. It lurched and uh, I was taking a picture of the King of Norway. Uh, all right, and yes. it ruined the finger here, and I didn't have time to go to a doctor to set the oh bone. And it's so what were, your hour, what were your hours? Oh my goodness. How well, I, all my life, including to this day, I get up about 3 in the morning. In fact, that's late for me. That's huh. late. I usually huh. get up sometime between one thirty two. Wow. And then I would work until 7 or 8 at night. If it was a night event, yeah. I would maybe get up a little later and work later. Uh -huh. But that's the way it was. Unbelievable. Um, well, let's, let's go to a few phone calls. By the way, uh, before we go uh, to the calls uh, briefly, that you, uh, as, as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, and we, never, we didn't get a chance to talk about this, you were one of the first uh, people, publishers, uh, writers, to speak out about circumcision, to speak out against circumcision, I should say, um, in the 60s and 70s and, of course, until now. Uh, this is an issue, I'm talking about male circumcision, this is an issue that's become a subject of a lot of debate and uh, a lot of uh, coverage in, the re in recent years. Well, yeah, that? right. I mean, it's clear to me it's a barbaric procedure, and we all know there's absolutely no medical justification for it. You were telling earlier about these uh, poor people desperate to try and find some uh, preventative yes. for AIDS, yes. cutting off a part of their sexual apparatus. Yes. I mean, it's really... It's horrendous. Yes, yes, I yes. mean, this belief uh, is rampant in some of the most primitive and some of the most highly developed societies of the world. Yes. It's obviously got very deep psychological roots. Mm. Freud addressed this. Uh, he believed that uh, the, uh, it was the, the root cause of anti-Semitism, for example, huh. because the procedure in non in non-circumscribing uh, societies, like, say, let's say, Germany, uh, causes tremendous anxiety hmm. among people. Hmm. And Why wouldn't it? Yeah, right, yeah, let's exactly. Let's take the most sensitive part of you and clop off some of it. Yeah. Right, you know. so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's preposterous that it goes on. If it weren't funded by uh, medical insurance still in this country, it wouldn't be as rampant here as it is. We all mm. know mm. that in Great Britain, under socialized medicine, as it used to be called, uh, they first funded circumcision, and they had the same circumcision rate that we have here in the United States. Yes. People there woke up, and the government said, uh-uh, we're not funding this absurd, barbaric, ghastly procedure any longer. Mm. They cut it, they cut it off, <laughs> shall we say, they cut <laughs> so the funding, yes, yes. and guess <laughs> what? The circumcision rate dropped to under 5%. Yes. Well, but the yes. education is required. You know, people have to no, know. No, no. They have to know the If truth. they have to start paying for it, they'll start well, to try and get the facts. That's right. And tell them about right. ouch. 
Well, well, I don't have to. Yeah. Shelton has told them uh, about that. Many. Oh, no, Ask was our own little foundation oh. that m militated against circumcision. It really? Its acronym was Outlaw Unnecessary Circumcision in Hospitals. Huh. Shoshana made up that name. Huh. As she has of the titles of my books, including this one I shot in New York, and most of the fine titles of anything I've ever done. I, I, we, I gotta have you. We gotta come. You gotta come back again. Hey, listen. We, we want to be here, man, because you got a lousy yeah, nine minutes yeah, left. I know. We haven't even <laughs> started to talk about the book. I, I, I know. We let's let's go to a few phones. We, you, we, we're gonna have you back again because okay. there's so, there's so much to talk about here. All right. We're on WBAI. We're talking with Ralph and Shoshana Ginsburg. Uh, Ralph Ginsburg is the author, the photographer of I Shot New York. I love the title, um, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Shoshana. <laughs> oh, really? Yes, okay. Yeah. Um, there's another book out. It came out recently, uh, few, several years ago, by um, Bill uh, Bob Fitch called The Assassination of New York. Maybe we should get these two books together. I Shot New York <laughs> and The Assassination yeah. of New York. At any rate, um, and uh, Shoshana Ginsburg, uh, you did the captions for the book, uh, and um, I, I like them um, very much. The um, Well, I have some favorite in here. I, I had some favorites in here, I must say, uh, of... Uh, some, some celebrities and stuff, but let's go to a phone call here. Some fo calls at two one two two zero nine two nine hundred four. WBAI, you're on the air. Hello. And I'm glad. Uh, you uh, excuse me. Who's this? This is James calling from Brooklyn. Hi. How are you? Uh, good. Thanks. Um, I'm glad you returned to the subject of uh, the circumcision with uh, AIDS because uh, <coughs> I think we're 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 appalled at the fact that there uh, people are circumcising. But also, we should be appalled at the fact that AIDS is, is the mythology of AIDS is being uh, perpetrated, you know, on yes. African people. Yes. I, I think that point should be making, and I'm sure your yeah. guests yeah. would be intrigued, sure. you know, if they haven't heard already about the uh, the falsity of the the the, uh, the notion that HIV is actually the cause of AIDS. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. And thanks. Let me. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. You want to come in on that? Do I? Yeah. I'm in no position to. I really don't <laughs> okay, know what Okay, about. okay. Right. Let's go to another call here. WBAI, you're on air. Hello? 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 Yes, you're on air. WBAI. Oh, yes, hello. Uh, I want to say, oh, Mr. Ginsburg, he brings back some old memories. I go back to the 60s, and I'm glad you stuck with it with your mag uh, magazine. Well, uh, yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Did I no, cut you I, off? I, I, just ha I have uh, my original copies of uh, Avant Garde. Oh, good. Huh. That's great. That was, as probably I said, be, probably collect that was a item. Great, great magazine. Thank you very much. That was the favorite of our magazines, to me anyway. Yeah. I yeah. appreciate that. Okay. Right on. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Let's go to another call here. 212-209-2900. WBAI, you're on the air for Ralph and Shoshana Ginsburg. Hi. It's uh, Ralph. Yeah. Hi. This is Michelle from uh, Westchester County. Yes, Michelle. Hi, I uh, heard your voice, and I ran downstairs to my basement, and lo and behold, I have issue number 11 of Avant Garde and Eros on Child by Ralph Ginsburg. Uh -huh. And amazingly enough, inside, I found two issues of The Realist. Oh, really? Oh. Yep. Yeah, right. We, uh, <laughs> that that's Paul right. Krasner. We, right. We pro profile Krasner. You don't happen to have the issue handy that has the article on WBAI, do you? I'm going to look downstairs, but, you know, my right. son was born in 1966, and when he was old enough to read, which was pretty early, he found all my copies of <laughs> oh my God, and I think he sold them. He cut them up <laughs> for school projects. I think he used you as one of his, um, you know, his... Uh, one of his dot uh, targets. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But I will look. Okay. You know. Great. I just wanted to say it was great hearing your voice. Thanks, Thank Michelle. You around doing things. Great, baby. Thank <laughs> Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you for calling. All right, it's good to call here. Maybe we can get a couple more in here. WBAI, you're on here on Walden's Pond. Yes, uh, hi. Uh, I just want to thank you uh, for the work that you did in the past of uh, breaking down these barriers to our existence. I, I would hope that you may have said, but I didn't hear the whole program, uh, something about BAI. You know, there's a whole problem with the unpaid volunteer workers who are even broadcasters being in the Electrical Workers Union, and the Pacifica Foundation wanted them removed. I, I, have you been hearing about this, Bill? Well, to tell you the truth, the first I heard of it was from yourself. <laughs> but from then, from a me couple or from Shelton? No, no, sorry, I'm uh, from, from Shelton. For me. But, right, when we were arranging from our appearance on his show, he mentioned it to me. Yeah, well, it's a terrible thing, and they're having the trouble with KPFA out there. They are, uh, Mary Frances Berry is supposed to speak at 7 tonight. Yes, uh, uh, Hopefully, she'll come off her thing, or she already said she's interested in ending the gag rule. 
Um, I, I worked on Monocle. You remember Monocle magazine? Certainly. In fact, uh, 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 Navasky is a neighbor of mine. Uh, and, you know, that What's, was a what, terribly what, 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 important what was, publication. What was, what was Monocle? Monocle was a highly sophisticated, really cutting, uh, satirical magazine of the 60s when there was a lot to be satirical and angry about. It right. was that very was, effective. We covered Goldwater and... Uh, uh, the FBI CIA uh, connections right. and so forth. That's right. By the uh, way, what's your name? Uh, my name is Monroe. I'm I was one of the art uh, right. assistants there. Right, very okay, good. Monroe, we got to run. I love you. Thanks a lot. Bob. Okay, Thank Monroe. You. Thanks for right. calling. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Monroe. Listen, we have to run. I just want to give you one minute to sort of wrap up. Uh, we will do this again. But um, what do you think? What, what do you want people to get from your book, I Shot New York, if they see? Just it a whole lot of pleasure and a keepsake of this uh, maddening. Uh, city. It really is. It was intended to be a, ca a time capsule of life in the in this uh, in New York in the final decade of the 20th century. Uh, I hope it has succeeded. It's had, uh, if I may say so, uh, almost universal um, enthusiastic criticism. And uh, mm -hmm. don't buy it. Just go to stores and he, page through it. <laughs> you can see his it. online uh, presence is Manhattanite. Ma Manhattan in, in his email, Ma he calls Ma himself Manhattan. Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pete Hamill, the noted writer, says, "quote I love these photos." So uh, you should definitely. I love them too, and I think they're great, and I think they're definitely for your coffee table or your library at home. Ralph and Shoshana Ginsburg, want to thank you very much for being here on Walden's Pond. Hey, time. thank you, pal. And it's, we're going to do it again. Re okay. Real soon. Hey, we're ready anytime. Real soon. And all you avant-garde subscribers, we ought to get you all together because you were so terrific. You make a wonderful club. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much again. And uh, again, the book is called I Shot New York by Ralph Ginsburg, legendary publisher and now photographer and uh, captions by his wife, Shoshana Ginsburg. They've been my guests here on Walden's Pond this afternoon here on WBAI on this, uh, what date is this? This is July, August 5th, 1999.